and shared. Excellent. And we're good to go. Are you seeing it in the presentation mode or in the... Um, um, well, we're seeing your slides full screen. Tick-borne diseases in the U.S., the, the, the lead slide is there. Okay. And if you're able oh. to advance them, okay, are we good, Shane? Can we let the doctor proceed? All right. The screens are split. Dr. C. Ben Beard, the stage is yours. And Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there today. It just seemed like almost impossibility to work out federal travel arrangements with uh, the new fiscal year and all this. And so um, anyhow, I'm thankful for the uh, technologies of of a webinar that we have. So thanks. And um, so what I'm going to talk with you today about really are the, the items you see on the slide here, uh, tick-borne diseases, the key, the key ones are the burden and distribution. Uh, we'll look at the disease trends across the country, um, the drivers for tick-borne disease emergence, and then we'll end by talking a little bit about uh, prevention. So um, as we say, the, the bottom line up front or the bluff, so to speak, uh, is that with regard to vector-borne diseases is that we're seeing a huge increase in vector-borne diseases over the last 10 or 20 years. And really between 2004 and 2019, uh, there were over 800,000 cases of vector-borne diseases reported in the United States. And a little bit later, I'll talk more about what we mean by reported versus uh, the total burden of illness. Uh, these numbers of cases of uh, tick, mosquito, and flea-borne uh, diseases have doubled over this period of time. The reported data substantially underestimates the actual disease occurrence or the burden of illness. Um, interestingly, we're seeing mosquito-borne disease epidemics happen more frequently. And, um, and then finally, and most uh, germane to this audience, tick-borne diseases now account for over 80% of all vector-borne disease cases, with uh, Lyme disease, of course, accounting for the lion's share of, of those. Um, beyond that, each year here in the U.S., there are fatalities that are caused by tick-borne diseases, uh, and these are mostly attributed to Rocky Mountain spotted fever, for Lyme disease, to Lyme disease carditis, and to Poisson virus encephalitis. So I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the burden and distribution <clears throat> of uh, tick-borne diseases. And uh, what you see in these uh, panels really are just kind of the most common or some of the most common tick-borne diseases, certainly not a list of all of them. But um, what I really wanted to point out here is you, you've got few sorts of clusters of tick-borne diseases, those that are associated with the uh, black-legged tick and uh, Ixodes scapularis and the western black-legged tick, Ixodes pacificus. These you see in the uh, top three panels, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis. You could, of course, add Poisson virus infection to, to this list. And you can see that the distribution of these cases um, sort uh, very well with the distribution of the tick vectors that transmit them. And then on the, the, the um, bottom three panels, uh, you see uh, tick-borne diseases that are really associated with um, two ticks, the American dog tick, uh, Dermacinter variabilis, and with the Lone Star tick, Amblyoma americanum. And so these are spotted fever rickettsiosis, ehrlichiosis, and um, tularemia, and um, could certainly add to that list as well. But those are some of the most notable ones that we are concerned with. Um, this is the Lyme disease transmission cycle. And I wanted to show this just uh, because, because this transmission cycle really spells out kind of a, a lot of understanding a lot of uh, information that's key in understanding the epidemiology and ecology, not only of Lyme disease, but of anaplasmosis, of, um, of um, Poisson encephalitis and babesiosis as well. But um, it, it begins um, in the spring when uh, the eggs are hatching and the, and the uh, larvae are coming out. Um, and the larvae are feeding kind of during the middle of the summer. And uh, you see that sort of in the left-hand side of the slide. I don't know, are you seeing, if I move my cursor, are you seeing this? Maybe, 
sorry, I said left hand, the right hand side uh, of the uh, slide. And then these larvae will feed uh, typically on small rodents or on birds, and uh, which are reservoirs for uh, for Lyme disease. So that's how for the Lyme disease pathogen, Borrelia burgdorferi. So that's how they become infected. And um, and then uh, the larvae actually feed. And um, throughout the summer, they, um, they, they fall off the host, they go down in the leaf litter, and then they emerge the following spring, which you see up in the top in the green area, as the nymphal stage of the tick. And this is the stage of the tick that's sort of what we often call the size of a poppy seed. It's very tiny. And um, in areas where, in New York in particular, Probably in most areas, maybe 20 to 40% of these ticks may be positive for Borrelia burgdorferi uh, because they became infected as a larval during their larva during their first feed. And these will come out and they feed on just about anything they can find. Uh, they'll feed again on rodents or birds. Uh, they'll feed on small mammals. So they uh, feed on, on deer and they feed on humans. And um, so this tick is the most important stage in terms of risk of infection to humans, just simply because they're really tiny. And if you if you get these on you, you may not see them. They'll bite and become attached. And often you won't even know they're there until it begins itching several days later. And by then, then of course, it's had ample time to transmit the pathogen. Uh, so these nymphs will feed, um, and they really come out in the early spring. So we see that's why we see a peak of infections uh, beginning in May. And uh, so they'll feed throughout the duration of the summer. They will um, molt, um, fa uh, they'll fall off, molt, and then come out in the um, fall of the year as adults. And so these are actually, these adult ticks are out in late summer and fall, really fall and in, even into the winter. And uh, this adult stage of the tick is, is easier to see. So actually, even though in this case, probably 40 to 60% of these are gonna be positive for Borrelia burgdorferi in endemic areas such as, as New York, um, they actually are not as important in transmission of disease to people just simply because you're more likely to see them and remove them before they have time uh, to um, bite and stay attached and transmit the pathogen. And then, of course, these will uh, feed and fall off and uh, drop off, and then they'll lay their eggs in the uh, spring, and then these are the eggs that hatch again. So that's sort of a, a breakdown of the life cycle. And it's important because there's a real uh, timing uh, to this that contributes to the epidemiology. Now, uh, this is a map that shows the distribution of, of the black-legged tick, Exodia scapularis, and its uh, close cousin, the, West, uh, the Western black-legged tick, Exodia pacificus, which you see in the West, West Coast. And blue and uh, for... Uh, Pacificus yellow are where these ticks have been reported before red and green are where they're actually established. So I just want to show that so you get kind of the perspective nationally, and I'll come back to, to this in a few minutes. Um, what I've shown in this slide are the top 10 uh, notifiable vector-borne diseases in the United States. Um, so these are just, you can see um, how many cases are reported each year. And um, so you can see, of course, that each year with Lyme disease, there's somewhere between 30 and 40,000 cases typically reported. Um, I'll show you trends on this uh, a little bit later. And of plasmosis is the ne next most common uh, tick-borne infection, followed by the other diseases as you see, see here. And as I mentioned, these are top 10 notifiable vector-borne diseases. And you can see other um, mosquito-borne illnesses here, malaria, dengue, uh, both of which are really travel-associated diseases, though we do have uh, some, and when I say travel, international travel, though we do have some dengue that occurs each year, uh, local transmission, mostly in Florida, occasionally on the uh, uh, Texas-Mexico border. And uh, West Nile virus infection, uh, tularemia, and chikungunya. So uh, this is just how tick-borne diseases stack up with the other reportable vector-borne diseases. And, um, and then, of course, begs the question, well, what about all reportable diseases? And so you can see here on this list that Lyme disease is the one, two, three, four, five, sixth most common 
notifiable disease in the United States. That was in 2019, but that's pretty much uh, the case each year. And uh, where you are in New York, it's actually more like the second or third most common reportable disease. So sometimes I've said if you live in the Northeast and you've had a reportable illness, if it's not an STD, it would probably be Lyme disease. So uh, that does just give you some sense for how common Lyme and other tick-borne diseases are. So in terms of disease trends, uh, this just shows what we've seen over the last 20 years or so in terms of uh, increase. And uh, Lyme disease, of course, is the turquoise, and you can see the other illnesses. Babesia just became reportable in uh, 2010, so the first numbers that we have for it are in 2011 in terms of national uh, notifiability. Ehrlichiosis, anaplasmus, uh, rickettsiosis, all of these numbers or are, are all these particular line are subject to underreporting. And uh, if you have questions about that, I'm glad to talk with you more about that at the end. Uh, the, the, uh, what we're seeing in the latter years, 2018, 2019, we don't have finalized numbers yet for 2020 or 2021, but we've seen a flattening of those cases. And much of that is due, um, well, in 2020, in part from COVID and the impacts that had on disease surveillance for all of our reportable diseases, but also partly due to the burden of um, surveillance uh, for Lyme disease, the burden associated with that on clinicians and on um, and surveillance experts at county and state levels. And so we've seen a real flattening out of those numbers, but I'll come back to that in a minute uh, to tell you what we've been doing to address that. Uh, also in terms of uh, trends, you know, I mentioned seasonality. Uh, what you're seeing here is from the Tick Bite Tracker data site, um, uh, website that we have at CDC, and you can see that in the link, and I've got this summarized toward the end of the presentation. But what you'll see here is five years of data, and you can, of course, filter this by uh, year and by region, and I've got this uh, data filtered for the Northeast currently, you can look over the last five years. And what this is really showing you, and this is sorted by week of the year or what we frequently call epi week. You can also filter this by month to get a little bit cleaner curve. But um, what you see here is that these two peaks, you have that first peak around uh, epi week um, 18, you know, beginning in uh, 14th or 15th or 16th week of the year. This is this is in May, and this is when the nymphal stage of that tick is coming out, and you see this huge peak of cases that are occurring there, or tick bites in this case, not cases. These are tick bites, and uh, and then you see this other trend uh, starting around Epi Week 40 and 41. So this is getting into the fall. Uh, late fall, and these are the tick bites associated with the uh, adult ticks. Um, so these are just the trends. This also correlates very well with when infections are, uh, occur. Uh, the, the actual case data, data itself, obviously, it's uh, associated with, um, with uh, tick bites. I also wanted to say a little bit about Poisson virus, neuroinvasive disease, and that's what you see in these slides uh, because uh, we see much fewer cases, fortunately, of uh, Poisson uh, because Poisson has a very significant case fatality associated with it, case fatality rate, but we are also seeing an increase in uh, Poisson virus infections as well. So, um, this um, now is really focusing on Ixodes scapularis, the primary vector of these diseases, Lyme, Anaplasma, Babesia, Poisson. And this is from our national tick surveillance data, which you see at the, um, the website here at the bottom of the slide. And this just shows you kind of where we are seeing the tick established. And, um, and then we're showing the estimated distribution of this tick. And you can see uh, the estimated distribution is all in yellow, but we're actually seeing it a, a huge expansion in where it's established. And all of this is sort of drifting north. And, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But we're also seeing uh, the establishment of this tick um, drift south as well, which is a very interesting finding. So um, over that same period of time where we've seen this massive expansion of ticks, 
Uh, you can also see an expansion of reported cases. And this is what you see in these panels. If you look at the data from 2001 and all this data is at our website, you can click through all these years from 2001 uh, to 2019. But these are so these are just two snapshots, which tell really a, a, a nice story. And you can see how um, Lyme disease cases, and this is one dot in uh, randomly placed in the county where the case was reported. And so you see this huge expansion uh, throughout the upper Midwest and the, the Northeast. And um, the one thing I would point out here is in the Northeast, you can see that Massachusetts is just gray. Uh, Maine is gray, a number of the Northeast states. In fact, there's a lot of gray in New York. And um, we went with gray shading just because uh, case reporting has become so burdensome that case reporting just is becoming less and less a, a good measure of uh, the trends in uh, Lyme disease um, uh, incidents and, and case, case numbers. And uh, so in Massachusetts, for example, there's limited funding to conduct surveillance. And so they prefer to use that funding really more to do something more about preventing illness than just simply counting cases. And um, so I'll just go ahead and say that, that we at CDC have been working with the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, CSTE, to change the reporting requirements for Lyme disease and, um, and case, um, case report forms, all of these things to make it much less onerous. So starting next year, uh, we'll really be tracking uh, laboratory um, reported cases, la uh, laboratory case, case reports, and not having to burden everyone with collection of surveillance data on all the cases. So, so we're hoping, um, if you have questions about that, I can send you more information or at least direct you to our website where we explain that. But we think that what will happen is that will be a much more um, um, consistent way of doing case reporting over, over the, the coming years um, so that states are all doing it in a more similar way and that the trends from year to year are more comparable. So uh, what you see in this slide is really just um, um, a paper we published a few years ago now, um, and it's showing in the slide the way high incident counties have increased over the last 20 years as well. And this is really from 1993 to 2012, so it's a little bit dated, but again, it's really demonstrating how we've seen this change in high incident counties, uh, that it's increased by 320% in the Northeast, and it's increased by um, approximately 250% in the North Central. Uh, part of the United States. And again, this just sort of shows a correlation of, of clinical illness with the expansion of the tick that we've seen over the last 20 years. Now, um, so I, I mentioned uh, underreporting and um, a little bit of the problems that we have with reporting. Um, so what we've resorted to do to try to get a better um, understanding of how much illness really is attributed to uh, bites of ticks, and particularly in this case, to Lyme disease. So we've um, come, conducted a couple of studies really looking at insurance databases, one in particular called MarketScan, and uh, using this uh, database of insurance claim, based on insurance claims, we can uh, extract information from it and uh, determine how many numbers of cases of Lyme disease were diagnosed and treated uh, per year. And then we do a lot of um, uh, uh, gymnastics with this to make sure that it's coming from the states where we, we know the cases are reported from and, and um, it, it's quite a elaborate work. But the, the most interesting thing here, the point I would make is that we completed this estimate a few years ago for the time window from 2005 to 2010. And the total, the estimated total number of cases of Lyme disease were diagnosed and treated per year was 329,000 or roughly, roughly that is the estimate. Well, so just this last year, we repeated the same um, estimate 
for the years from 2010 to 2018. So this is sort of fast forward uh, to almost a decade later. And using the same um, methods of analysis, the same database of insured patients, we found that the number of cases per year has now increased to over 476,000 cases per year. So I think that's very sobering uh, and it tells us both two things. One, uh, some information about the trend uh, that we're the, the total burden of illness that Lyme disease causes, but also we're seeing uh, some very interesting and alarming data about the trends that we're seeing. And this is really by and large not picked up in, in surveillance data. And so that's the reason why this is really important to uh, do. So I wanted to um, move on and say a little bit about other diseases, not just Lyme, uh, but particularly the diseases that are common in, in your part of the country. I've already mentioned Powassan virus neuroinvasive disease. Uh, uh, this, this is a very serious illness. Um, and you can see New York York is actually one of the states where we have um, one of the, among the larger numbers of cases that are reported. Um, it's also associated with bites of the uh, black-legged tick, Exodes scapularis. Um, so this is something that's uh, newer, and um, if I was there in the room, I might ask for a show of hands to see how many people are familiar with this particular phenomena, but I wanted to take a little time just to familiarize you with it because it's something that we're seeing more and more of. It's called alpha-gal syndrome, and alpha-gal uh, galactose, alpha-1,3 galactose is a, is a sugar molecule that's found in many mammals, but it's not found in fish, reptiles, birds, or people. And uh, it can be found in meat, particularly in pork, beef, rabbit, lamb, uh, venison, and products made from um, mammals, including gelatin, cow's milk, milk products, things like that. It's, just, it's not um, a, a sugar that is in higher primates, particularly in humans. So if we're exposed to this, there's a chance that we can develop uh, an immune response to this alpha-gal uh, sugar moiety. And um, so this has been um, seen as a serious, potentially life-threatening allergic reaction. It's not an infection per se. Uh, the symptoms occur after eating red meat um, or from exposure to other products that contain alpha-gal. And there's growing evidence that suggests that it, it's triggered by the bite of the Lone Star tick in the United States and by other species of ticks in other parts of the world. But you see the Lone Star Tick here in this panel. Uh, it's, it's obvious why we call it the Lone Star Tick. It's got this one little dot and it's on its back. And, um, and this tick has expanded really significantly across the U.S. and it used to be really more limited to the central and southern part of the U.S. And now we're seeing it all the way up into the Northeast, into New York and Connecticut and other places like that. And it's actually a very aggressive biter of people. It's a vector of uh, ehrlichiosis, among other things, but it's been also been associated with this syndrome. So the symptoms um, commonly appear two to six hours after exposure, which is one of the reasons people don't necessarily correlate um, this, this uh, allergic reaction with ingesting red meat um, because it doesn't happen immediately after you eat it. Typically, uh, these are the re the uh, symptoms that you can see: hives, um, itchy, nausea, nausea or vomiting, heartburn, diarrhea, uh, so forth and so on. And these symptoms can actually vary very significantly to person to person. They can be severe and even life threatening. And some people are so sensitive to this that um, they can have this type of reaction just from being in the room. For example, in a kitchen when someone's cooking bacon on the stovetop. And so it is a very significant clinical sim syndrome that we're seeing now. And, um, and the alpha-gal um, sugar has been uh, detected in the saliva of ticks, several species of ticks, mo most notably uh, in the U.S., Amblyoma americanum, the Lone Star tick. Uh, in terms of managing this, and we have more information at our website if this is something that you uh, want to uh, learn more about. But um, all that can be done at this day, but, uh, at this state, really is a avoiding products that contain alpha-gal. Uh, reactions can be managed with antihistamines and corticosteroids and other medications, uh, avoiding future tick bites because there's some evidence that ticks can continue to stimulate this. 
um, and then uh, in many cases, just lifelong avoidance of meat. So this is this is a really significant life uh, change uh, for the people who've been affected by the syndrome. And of interest that it's gotten so much attention that actually been genetically modified pigs now that have been created that uh, do not have alpha-gal in their tissue. So uh, that's kind of a creative uh, way of dealing with the issue. Um, and really, all I wanted to say from this, this is a recent paper that we published uh, that, that really emphasizes the how broad scale this uh, problem is that um, more than 34,000 people, mostly presumably symptomatic, have received positive tests for IgE antibodies to alpha-gal. Uh, there's a test for this and um, that, that can be used and it suggests that this alpha-gal syndrome is an increasingly recognized uh, public health problem. And the distribution um, is consistent with amblyomma americanum ticks. And that's really what you see in the slide. Uh, this is just, just showing uh, how these uh, reported um, diagnosed cases of alpha-gal um, are distributed across the United States. And uh, finally on this, I just wanted to show you this slide because this shows the distribution of amblyomma americanum. Canum. And again, this is kind of showing where it's been reported and where it's now established. And you can see that it's both is reported all through throughout New York, but it's established, become pretty well established kind of in the southern area along the Hudson River. And it is something that we're seeing expand uh, northward each year. So we're tracking this now through our national tick surveillance. Uh, program. And I don't know, uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Um, uh, Bagmani may have more to say about that, this because I know he's doing a lot of uh, tick surveillance work there in New York. So I, I look forward to his presentation uh, after this one. Um, I, I also wanted to mention that not only we're seeing more and more cases of tick-borne diseases, we're also seeing more uh, tick-borne pathogens. And this is what you see in the slide. Um, I'm um, conscious of the time. Um, I don't I can't reduce this, can't minimize this on my, uh, actually, let me do this real fast. I just wanted to check. I don't want to run over. I want to make sure I give time for uh, for questions. So, okay, so we're, this should go until uh, to um, 2 p.m. my time. Okay. Um, what are you seeing now? I just minimized. I've got three screens open. Are you seeing the slides okay still? Can you hear me? Is anyone there? Oh, yes, doctor. Thank you. Did you just say you'll take questions? Oh, no, no, no. I was just saying, um, I was asking, I minimized my screen so I can make sure what time I'm supposed to be been ending. And I wanted to make sure you're, st you're still seeing the slides. Everybody is seeing the slides. Everybody is still here. We haven't left. It's about 1.40 p.m. And we'd like, to, we'd like to have time for a few questions when you're done with your presentation. I will, I will make sure that we do. Okay, good. So uh, this is just showing uh, the... Um, uh, that we're also having a huge number of new uh, tick-borne disease cases that are uh, occurring and um, in in the that have been dis detected in the U.S. and um, can talk about that more later if need. Also, also want to mention in terms of emerging issues the Asian longhorn tick because it's a very important uh, vector. Of, um, of some very severe viral infections in other parts of the world. This was introduced into the U.S. and has become established. And this slide just shows kind of the um, area, a uh, habitat suitability model, which shows uh, where we think that this tick could possibly expand. And this is a very important issue because this tick can potentially carry Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and um, though we don't have laboratory data to support it, uh, it's very likely that it would um, be able to transmit some of the other uh, tick-borne viral pathogens that we have here in the U.S. as well. Um, so, so that's another thing to be aware of. Um, kind of winding down, I want to see, say a little bit about the drivers of tick-borne disease emergence, since we're having all of this sort of rapid emergence of both of new pathogens and also increased numbers of cases. 
Uh, the, the classic drivers that we think of are such things as reforestation, overabundant deer populations, uh, the expansion of suburbia into wooded areas, uh, abundant habitat around homes uh, for the Lyme disease reservoir hosts. So these are the white-footed mouse and, uh, and uh, um, my, uh, my, microtus voles. Um, animals like that, possibly birds. We're seeing increased numbers of ticks and increased um, exposure opportunities for people. And then, of course, um, a changing climate is very likely contributing uh, to multiple ones of these factors. But on the right, you're just seeing kind of uh, this this little cartoon about New England before the trees returned. It really shows at the turn of, uh, before the turn of the century that uh, back in the early 1900s, um, at least, uh, that much of the Northeast was was uh, tilled and was utilized for agriculture. And there were very few deer. Um, the, the populations were actually tiny compared to now. And so now we've had reforestation, the growth of suburbia, and this huge increase in the numbers of deer. And so this has certainly been a huge driver for all of these tick-borne diseases. Also with the climate change, with the changing climate, we're seeing uh, uh, other factors such as longer and warmer summers, shorter and milder winters, fewer frost days, which is what you see in this uh, panel on the right. This is some uh, data from NOAA. And um, we're seeing more intense heat waves, less intense cold waves, uh, increased frequency of severe and unpredictable weather events, and, and then a lot of regional variation, as you can also see in this slide. So these things obviously have a big impact on uh, vector-borne diseases, tick-borne diseases especially. This is going back to the tick bite tracker data. And again, just to show that this peak, and this is sorted by month, and you can see that these peak numbers of uh, tick bites really occur in May, and then again in October and no November. And again, these are associated with, um, with the two stages of ticks that transmit uh, Lyme disease. Well, this is from a paper we published a few years ago. I'm not going to go into the details here, but only just to summarize it and saying, look, using uh, different emission scenarios and different, an ensemble of different uh, downscale weather models, what these data show is they predict that um, with the changing climate, projecting this out uh, into um, all the way out to 2080, uh, that, that what we predict from this is that we're going to see ticks coming out earlier and earlier in the year and then staying out later in the year. And so what that means is we'll have a much longer transmission season. And we, we have actually seen this over the last 20 or 30 years that we're seeing cases occur earlier and earlier in the year and, um, and, and that the transmission goes longer into the season. So this is certainly part of the reason why uh, we're seeing increasing numbers of cases of tick-borne diseases, because the ticks are out there earlier and they're out there longer and people are expo more people are exposed to them over a longer period of time, which is actually kind of what you're seeing here in this slide um, in a summary fashion. Shorter, shorter and milder winters, increasing minimal temperatures. These allow ticks to expand more in more northward distributions. And um, these also lead to larger tick populations and a longer activity, seasonal activity, which all of that translates into more cases. So looking forward, really the factors that are driving tick-borne disease emergence, they're not likely to change. The trends are likely to persist and even worsen in the absence of an effective prevention tool. And more and more Americans are increasing risk. So um, kind of the bad news, currently there's no vaccines that are available for any in use for any of the tick-borne diseases. In fact, no vaccines for any vector-borne diseases here in the continental U.S., except uh, dengue. There's a dengue vaccine that's coming on board right now, and we have just begun using that in Puerto Rico, uh, where we have uh, endemic, so-called endemic dengue. No vaccines for tick-borne diseases currently. Uh, there is one that is in phase two clinical trials currently uh, for Lyme disease. 
in probably three to five years, though, at the earliest before it might be out. So prevention efforts really focus on reducing exposure of ticks uh, on persons, pets, and property, and quickly removing ticks, doing tick checks, uh, wear repellents, and then, of course, if you have any sort of symptoms, really uh, encouraging um, uh, going in to see your healthcare provider because early and accurate diagnosis tr and treatment is really critical, as I think someone mentioned earlier, to preventing um, uh, both acute illness and also the uh, persistent symptoms that we see, particularly associated with patients that are not treated, that are not diagnosed early and treated accurately. So uh, we have a number of resources uh, that you can see. This is at um, cdc.gov slash ticks. And it's a very easy website. Uh, we've got information here uh, to uh, healthcare providers and more information on where ticks uh, live. Uh, there's a link to this tick bite tracker data, also to our national uh, tick surveillance program, which uh, is where those maps are from that, that I showed on distribution. And um, these, again, are some of the web links to uh, information we have for healthcare providers and the other sources that I mentioned. So um, kind of in closing, we're working with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on a vector-borne disease national strategy. And this was authorized by the K. Hagan Tick Act. Uh, Kay Hagan was a senator, North Carolina senator, who actually died uh, from Powassan virus encephalitis very tragically. And so this was a, a big, a huge bill that was passed that really uh, strengthens, um, you know, work with vector-borne disease in the U.S. And um, the strategic priorities for this uh, framework that, uh, that has been developed and published, and it's the basis for the vector-borne disease national strategy, effort that's currently underway really is understanding the trends and drivers um, under and uh, vector and human case surveillance and previous surveillance efforts, um, improving prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, and then working with state and local uh, health departments and officials uh, for implementation of vector-borne disease prevention and control tools. So uh, in conclusion, tick-borne diseases are a very important public health concern. They're increasing in the U.S., both in incidence and in distribution, and also in the numbers of new pathogens that we're seeing, uh, that the drivers are multifactorial uh, related to climate change, but also all of these other changes in the natural and built environment that have increased uh, human exposure to ticks. And then finally, in the absence of vaccines, primary prevention focuses on reducing exposure to ticks and quickly removing any ticks that are on people or on their clothing. In short, uh, we, you know, we can, we, we recommend if you've been out in an area where ticks are, that, um, and this is a message that healthcare providers should, should emphasize to their patients, to wear repellents, to uh, do tick checks. Uh, after you've been out in the field, you can throw your clothes in the dryer for 10 minutes on high heat and kill any ticks that you brought in with you. And then uh, you can shower off after being in outdoors, and this can help remove um, ticks that may be on you and not bitten you. So I'll, I'll stop with that and have a few minutes here for questions, and um, I will stop sharing my screen. Well, Dr. Beard, here. if you can hear me, I want to thank you on behalf of this room full of doctors and clinicians who have been hanging on your every word. My favorite part was where you've said as you got to the last slide about, well, here's the bad news. It kind of seemed like mostly bad news to me. Um, no vaccine. But who would like to raise a hand and ask a question of Dr. Uh, Margot Pinario? Yes, hi. Um, so you mentioned in understanding trends and drivers. Um, and then you also mentioned early and accurate diagnosis and treatment. So it sounds to me, and maybe I misunderstood it, that it's putting it back on the medical field. And I feel like the CDC guidelines, um, for instance, in my case, I did not meet the requirements for the test. So I would have been considered not to have been infected by Lyme, but I know for a fact I have Lyme. So is there any... I guess, research into changing the testing? No, I, I, don't, um, I don't know enough about what you're describing to comment on that. I mean, what we, what we actually say is that, um, that if someone comes in with a tick bite and the symptoms, 
that if they're in an area that's endemic for Lyme disease, that, um, you, you know, we think that even while someone's a physician may have ordered to test and they're waiting for the results to come back, that they should go ahead and treat a patient empirically. And, and we certainly encourage physicians, healthcare providers to use their best judgment for this. And we have a new module that's been uh, created at our website at one of those links that are shown that really um, uh, we hope will help healthcare providers better understand um, when they should treat, uh, when they should run a di diagnostic test, what test is the best to do. And if the test is either negative or indeterminate to realize kind of better about what their options are for treatment. But um, I, I understand what you're saying. And there's a lot of work that we can do in this area. We are constantly reviewing and updating um, our, our healthcare provider education, and um, you will, we will continue to do that going forward. Well, doctor, I think that Q&A is what's going to probably dominate the remainder of this afternoon and tomorrow morning at our conference here in Saranac Lake. Dr. David Garrison from Pennsylvania. Hi, back in, I think it was 2000, I'd given out a lot of Lyme vaccine and it disappeared about a year later. The only complication I saw is I had a couple of people who had autoimmune diseases and it really caused flares. But whatever happened to that vaccine and was there any effectiveness? You know, what else about it? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So um, that was Lyme Rix and it was pulled from uh, the market as you, as you mentioned in 2001 or 2002. Um, there was, um, I think it was a class action lawsuit that was brought um, by patients who, um, who had received the vaccine, and then they uh, claimed that they had an adverse reaction to the vaccine or, or developed symptoms associated that, that are similar to those of chronic Lyme disease uh, from taking the vaccine. And um, the actual VAERS report, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System report, for Lyme um, actually was really nice. There were there were um, and and they're very consistent with what you what you just said. Uh, the rate of of um, adverse events were equal to or actually lower in in vaccine recipients than in uh, the control uh, from uh, from the same locations and matched by age and geography and other things like that. But um, you know this was. This way, you know, the claims of uh, patients were that uh, the adverse events that they were reporting were ignored by healthcare providers. And, and um, so anyway, the vaccine, uh, which was um, uh, SmithKline Beecham originally, or GlaxoSmithKline as the company came to be, and is now was pulled from the from the market uh, officially due to lack of sales. And uh, so there was some work that was done kind of along the same lines, looking at, at um, uh, uh, particular peptide uh, domains of the um, OSP-A. OSP-A was the target of that vaccine. And uh, there was some, um, some discussion and thought about the possibility that one of the particular uh, peptide domains of, of that protein uh, could stimulate an autoimmune response that was cross-reactive with, with a HLA um, a particular dom domain. And um, so that, of course, was also studied. And then that was later thought that that wasn't, um, that that could be ruled out. But whatever the case with the new vaccine that's come out that uh, was developed by Valneva and is now being um, evaluated together with Valneva and Pfizer, uh, they actually removed this um, HLA um, potentially cross-reacting region from the OSPE domain. And then they also are from the OSPE peptide. And they have also broadened the OSPE uh, peptide um, uh, moieties to include uh, some of the European um, Borrelia sensu lato species. So that vaccine um, has a broader range of effectiveness, not just against Borrelia burgdorferi here in the U.S., but some of the European, um, particularly Asphalae and uh, Garenii. So that vaccine, um, that particular question, we hope has been taken off the table. 
And um, and that vaccine was a pretty, it, it, I would have to actually say the data uh, showed that that vaccine was very effective. The downside of it is that you had to get the initial vaccine, you had to get a booster, I think two months later, and then a third booster uh, later, maybe six months later, if I remember, or nine, and then you would be required annual boosters every every year for that. So, um, you know, there's, um, but it is effective and, and apparently safe, but we'll see. And those clinical trials are still underway. Thank you. I want to squeeze in as many questions as I can. Uh, Dr. Robert Semler has a couple of related questions. Yeah, actually, as a follow-up on that, there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about 15 years ago that said that people who had HLA B27 were more prone to chronic sequelae, in particular um, joint pains. Um, so it's very interesting what you just said. Um, the other thing is, how do you distinguish between people who have old Lyme disease and people who actually have new Lyme disease? Because I've been bugged by public health said, oh, your patient has Lyme disease. I said, no, he doesn't. He doesn't have any symptoms. That is a, is a great question. And I'm not sure if I connected the very part of that, the last part of that um, to your question. But the first part of it, how do you, the, the basic question, how do you determine where sim if symptoms that patients have right now are attributed to a new Lyme disease case or an old Lyme disease case? You know, this is just one of the, the limitations of serological testing. Uh, once people develop an antibody response, uh, they, they have that for some time. It eventually uh, tapers off, it lowers, but, um, you know, it's, it's a real problem. And that's one of the reasons there's a huge amount of activity right now that's really focused on developing direct diagnostic tests. So these are tests that don't that aren't looking at your serologic response. They're actually looking for the Borrelia itself, either to detect um, RNA molecules that are indicative of ongoing infection, or uh, using metagenomics and looking at you know next gen sequencing types of approaches that may be more sensitive at detecting actual uh, DNA that's, that's there. So these are sort of like the COVID test, you know. There's the uh, antigen test and there's the antibody test. And unfortunately, with Lyme disease right now, uh, the tests that are most reliable or that are licensed by um, FDA uh, are, are all antibody tests. Culture is of very little use and PCR is very, very little use just because the time in which you can detect circulating uh, uh, organisms is, is often transient for um, most of these tick-borne diseases. Are there any other questions? Uh, we, we're, we're close on time, but I sure don't want to let this room full of, of experts. So Dr. Katie Anderson is here from Onondaga County, New York. Thank you. SUNY Upstate for now, Onondaga soon. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Beard. Um, one question I had is, are there any new innovation, innovative options kind of on the horizon for how to control the ticks? So thinking about the dengue world, for example, and what they're doing to the Aedes aegypti mosquito, are there plans for bacteria that could interrupt transmission? Are there any transgenic exodes out there? Are there any options on the horizon for controlling the tick itself? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we do have a product, Nucatone, that we're excited about. We got this, um, um, we discovered it at CDC. Uh, it's very effective against ticks. And uh, recently we were, uh, it's been licensed to a company called Evolva and uh, they are working on formulations of shampoos and soaps that could actually be used for repellents and, and, uh, and a care size that could be used right on people. This is a derivative of Alaskan yellow cedar. It's also found in citrus peel. And uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, there are other approaches, you know, I, I would really, uh, I know there's a lot of aversion to synthetic pesticides, but I think if you treat your yard uh, once or twice a year, that, that's another way uh, to um, limit or remove ticks that are in your own backyard. And, um, and then there are other ways that for landscape management. And we have at that web link I showed, it shows a lot of, lot of way, things you can do around your yard to, um, to minimize the risk for exposure to ticks. But no new silver bullet, unfortunately. All right. I'm 